This is a uh, Inside Jerry's Brain pop-up on Friday, November 23rd, 2018. Uh, Conversations in Context is the notion behind this. And uh, I want to be picking interesting and sometimes thorny topics and, uh, and make an invitation that will bring uh, interesting and seldom thorny people like you uh, into uh, conversations where we feed off of this mind map I've been building and feed the mind map during the conversation. So I'll be screen sharing a bunch off and on. And I apologize ahead of time that <clears throat> sometimes as you're speaking about something that I realize I have a lot of material on, I will pop that uh, into screen share uh, behind us. You'll probably, uh, on the recording, you'll still be able to see uh, who's speaking uh, next to it. But, but the idea is partly to explore what happens when we have context around the conversation. Does it, does it improve the conversation? Does it improve our memory? Um, how does that work? Sky, you're making it, excellent. <laughs> Glad to see you there. Uh, I'm just kind of explaining a little bit about what, uh, what the, the idea behind Inside Jerry's Brain is. <clears throat> and uh, I think, let me just jump right in with a screen share because I had uh, two things I wanted to talk about on the way in uh, on this notion of screen sharing. Uh, reset my screen a little bit. Um, one of them is uh, one of my inspirations and probably a lot of people's inspirations is uh, Brene Brown. Uh, and if, if she's not an inspiration to you and you've got a critique of Renee, I'd love to hear it because so far she just hits the right notes for me all the time. And uh, the, talk, the talk that kind of woke me up uh, to her existence on the planet. Uh, Sorry. If you want to mute yourselves in and out, that, that would be, that would be awesome. I'm just going to turn it off. I forgot I had it on. Excellent. Um, so the talk of hers that that sort of uh, made me aware of her existence was her TEDx talk in 2010. She did a, she did a TED talk later on, <clears throat> which was really good, but not as good as this one. Somehow, somehow this TEDx talk was really pretty fantastic. TEDx Houston, and uh, she tells the story of her, her, uh, her psychology professor mentor who basically said, if you can't measure it, it doesn't exist. And then she goes into a whole series of things about vulnerability, shame, uh, and so forth. And in particular, that um, things like what makes you vulnerable also makes you beautiful. Uh, and that vulnerability is the path to authentic uh, connection and joy. And that the way forward is through vulnerability, which is letting go of control. Uh, so a bunch of these things we can come back to in different ways. I just wanted to, I, I wanted to give a, a quick glance of, of this in my brain because what I do with, this is a, a TEDx talk, so you can see from the icon that there's a, a link attached to this thought. Each node in my brain is called a thought. And again, also my apologies that for those of you who, who are coming back to Inside Jerry's Bain, I'll probably do a little bit of tutorial as we, as we go through it, just for whoever's new. Um, so this little red icon that looks an awful lot like a YouTube uh, logo is in fact YouTube's fave icon because this is a link to Brene's talk. If I click on the link right now on the, on the little logo, it'll launch my browser and start playing Brene's talk, uh, this one in particular. <clears throat> so what I do with books and articles and posts and videos that I really love is I debrief them into my brain. So this is not in the order she said them. This is just in alphabetic order because that's kind of how the brain uh, organizes things. But, you know, she says things in this talk like let yourself be seen deeply. Uh, practice, gratitude, and joy, uh, what, I, what I just went to. And um, later articles like this one <clears throat> that refer back to this talk. So here's a, a post, uh, I think it's a post by Bill Gross about uh, vulnerability and about how vulnerability can help you succeed in business. In this case, let me just uh, click on it and go to the browser and see what the post was because I don't, put all the details in the brain. I, I, I rely on the links to give me back what the articles were. There we go. So this is an article by Bill Gross, the founder of Idea Lab, And he recently saw Amanda Palmer's uh, amazing TED Talk in Long Beach and is basically talking about that. Uh, so he writes this post, Vulnerability Can Help You Succeed in Business, which is referencing Amanda Palmer and Brene Brown. So if I click on Amanda Palmer, who I'm also a big fan of, uh, she wrote a book titled The Art of Asking, and uh, is an artist who really, really throws herself on the crowd in a, in a really interesting way. So uh, here's the book, The Art of Asking, which I just noticed is not connected to her talk, 
So I'm going to make that link because I'm pretty sure that the talk preceded the book, led to the book. So now I've made a little link like that. Uh, so let me go back to Brene and the talk, and then I'm going to go someplace else for a second. But let me just pause here <clears throat> and just see if any of you have any thoughts or comments where we are. Well, a question, and it may not be appropriate for today, but you noted that these are in alphabetical order, not in date order. Is there a way to force other kinds of sequencing, or do you find that useful to do or not? So there's, um, and it's totally like, great question, not an interruption. Um, there's two ways I can organize uh, the views that I have on the thoughts. So everything above and over here, these are sibling thoughts. So these are, these are uh, children of common parents, mm -hmm. child thoughts. And then these are all the child thoughts right now. I can organize them either alphabetically or by last touched, I think. Uh -huh. I'm not sure whether it's touched or changed, but chronologically, okay. right? And those are the two choices when you're organizing how to view your brain. The thing that I do now and then when I want to preserve some kind of order is I number them. Okay. So I'll do, I'll do numeric order. So uh, the place, I think I showed this. You showed uh, the other day, you did. I, yeah. I showed a numeric yeah. wisdom. So that yeah. that's i'll just do one dot and then boom and then they sort alphabetically in the right order mm -hmm. what, what i also do for example on my event schedule mm -hmm. is i do a year month so this is 2018 february 2018 march uh, 2018 april right 1804 is 2018 april because if you do year month with two two numbers for each it you know once we got past the y2k problem it sorts very nicely and naturally into a, a readable order that is also happens to be chronological. Yeah. Um, so if I go back to Brene, um, what I wanted to I also show as an opening to the conversation is uh, a piece that most people don't know exists in the world. So it's funny. In one sense, this is me, my most vulnerable spot in the brain, because I'm, I'm sort of saying, this is what I believe to be true in the world. Uh, in another sense, I'm hiding in plain sight because nobody knows my brain exists. Ex you know, those of you who've just joined the call are discovering this probably mostly for the first time. Uh, raise your hand if you knew that I posted my beliefs in my brain. Excellent. So Judy ran across it and nobody else. Um, so I actually wish, uh, sorry, go ahead, Judy. Well, I just want to comment that as I mentioned in one of my notes, I think I started looking at the brain back in probably maybe not right away after we met in 06, but maybe in 08 or something after I started coming into some of the ETAN calls. And I was fascinated and a little over, more than a little overwhelmed by your brain way back then. And it's just gotten bigger. Um, but it is really fascinating. And, and I love the depth and breadth and connectivity of it. Thank you. One, one of the dangers of doing Inside Jerry's Brain and giving tours of my brain is that other people are dissuaded from trying to do their own mind mapping or other kinds of connectivity because they're like, well, crap, you know, look how much stuff is here. I'm never going to get there. And to them, I say, hey, after I put 100 things in, it was useful and it was fun. Like part of the, part of the thing that's really fun is not seeing the completed cake, but baking the cake. And, and the, the little decisions you have to make along the way of, okay, so how, I'm gonna, how am I gonna treat this? I've, I've noticed a recurring issue. I've got lots of books in my brain. Do I put authors above the books or below the books? Those decisions come up a bunch and you have to figure them out and then you have to remember them later so that you're consistent over time. <laughs> my, own, my own take is if you're not consistent in that way, your brain becomes mush and then, and then you know, chaos ensues and then the end of the world will, will catalyze right after that. Did you pick um, authors? Because it seems like authors would be better because then you'd at least cluster in a, a, a topical direction rather than the title because the titles get really random. So what I did was I always put books under authors and I always put blog posts under authors mm -hmm. because they are crea it's a generative work. They're creating the work. The work descends, comes from them. So my own take on it, and other people have used lateral links for authors. I've seen whatever you want. But for me, it seemed like a, an author was writing, creating a, a, this creative work called a book. Um, now I put actors under their movies because the actors are, are acting in a movie. And mm -hmm. I put the author of the screen, the, the screenwriter or the novelist who wrote the novel that the, that the movie is based on are above the movie. So I can, I can show that as well. Okay, um, and, I, and I do that pretty consistently so that then all actors are under their movies. Now, if an actor also directed, I use the lateral links for directing. So it, it can get a little bit messy, but actually not that bad. And if an actor directed in a movie that 
he or she also acted in, that breaks me. I can't, I can't put the actor in both roles. That doesn't really particularly work. So I, I put them as the director because that to me is the more important role. And you'll figure out that they also acted in it mm. when you go look at the movie kind of thing, right? But, but here, like, um, I go into some territory that's pretty normal, like, hey, I believe in global unity. I think that, you know, everyone uh, is, is actually sort of, we're all deeply intertwingled, for example. So global unity is a really nice thought that collects up uh, lots of different people's ideas about uh, global unity, everything from uh, Teilhard de Chardin's idea of the noosphere, uh, which is one of many different spheres, we can come back to that, to uh, John Muir writing about global unity uh, way back when, the quote is probably down here in the notes field, which I've covered over with your videos for the moment. Uh, the idea, uh, Jagdish Chandra Bose, who had really idea, really interesting ideas out of biology about global unity. And uh, <clears throat> he talks about how plants actually have feelings in different ways. He's a, a polymath. So for instance, uh, I've got a thought called polymaths, which is uh, people who knew a lot about a lot of stuff, which is a, an interesting thing to me. And then back to global unity, uh, Edgar Mitchell, one of our astronauts who, uh, who, who he was on Apollo 14, ended up co-founding the Institute of Noetic Sciences, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So um, interesting things there. So global unity, not that controversial, I think. Um, Jerry? But, yeah, go ahead. Um, not to accuse you of being obsessive or anything. Oh, I would never cop to that. No. But can you give us some sense of how much time you spend with the brain. I mean, maybe you're in it all the time, uh, but I'm just trying to get a feel for the, the temporal investment in producing this map that we're looking at here. Yeah, so the brain is- and A very practical ask, because I've, I've, as you know, I've made several attempts at working with this. I've not been able to stay with it consistently, uh, and I'm interested in doing that, and I want some guidance about how to, how to frame it. How to cool, cool. <laughs> Well, the brain, I only, I only author the brain on my laptop. So it's always open on my laptop. And I have, as you can see from the way I've arranged my desktop, but it may not be obvious to you, um, I make it so that there's always an inch free. So I can see my browser here uh, oh. enough so that I can see the link and the URL. Because when I drag something into the brain, when I put something new in the brain, what I do is I grab this link and I drag it to the brain. That's just the quickest way for me to put something new in the brain. So my browser is open so that there's an inch of the brain showing on the far right. Yeah. Okay. Right. Which means my brain is always visible to me. It's always sitting here and it's both a reference and a repository. So, so it's both the place that I consult for, gosh, gosh, I could have sworn I already read an article about this. Right. Mm -hmm. So when I have that moment and I know that the article was worth remembering, I'm pretty sure it's in here. And the act of finding it will refresh my memory of that old one and then will let me put this new article that I just, just, just somebody wrote yesterday that I discovered this morning in the flow of emails or whatever and put it in. And the act of putting something in the brain is 30 seconds to a minute, mm -hmm. right? Because I have, to make, I have to make a couple quick decisions. One, is it worth remembering? Yep. Two, where does it go? Three, drag it in and then like, how do I improve it? Do I, do I connect it to more things? Do I put the author's name in? That kind of thing. And eh, that's probably about a minute. Now, if you were using Delicious or a bookmarking service, you would probably spend 20 seconds you know, bookmarking it to Delicious. If all you did was control D uh, in your browser and add it to the long list of links that, that are stored in your browser's history, that would take you know, uh, uh, two seconds, except it would be useless, right? So, so you actually have, you have to put a little bit of work into the memory part of this in order for it to pay off later on down the road. But, but I, I do a bunch of this all the time and you get pretty quick at it after a while. I mean, um, it's, it's the gesture of, of remembering, curating, gardening, connecting something in is not that time consuming to me. Um, but that, you're, also, that, you're, also, you're also distilling. I mean, you're pulling out the three or eight main points in the article. What, what's really interesting is that I can then go back to articles or books that I really care about. And uh, not only that, but um, you know, I, I can find a thing that then connects up to another concept of wholeheartedness, which then takes me to uh, the five R's of a wholehearted apology that was written as on, in the book Effective Apology uh, by John Cater, right? And I don't remember that I made those links, but, but wholeheartedness itself is a topic. 
And that's something I, my brain really works that way. So I value these little lateral travels through the rhizomal uh, connectedness of everything. That, that gives me a little oxytocin hit in my brain when I do that. <clears throat> right? so, so there's a natural reward system for me for the work of putting in, making sure that everything's typed pretty clearly. You know, if you just jam everything in there and don't pay attention to it, it, it turns into a, like the dark forest really quickly. Mm -hmm. Do you have, so pretty much whenever you're at the computer, you're also doing brain as pertinent? Pretty much. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and, and so whatever comes by that's interesting deserves to be remembered. <clears throat> it's a little bit like the history guy, history that deserves to be remembered. So you sit only on your laptop. So when you're out and about with your phone or your pad, you're just not curating? Uh, I, I will, if I'm at a meeting, I will capture notes in, in Evernote. I will mm -hmm. capture links to put into the brain later. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I seldom uh, go back and harvest those links. Mm. Just not a habit I have. So, so I, can, I can lose a bunch of good links in some periods. And there have been two or three times in the 21 years I've been using the brain. In fact, uh, in a couple of weeks, it'll be 21 actual years that I've been feeding this one mind map. Because the, the file you're looking at right now is the same file that I started 21 years ago. Um, and there have been two or three times when the brain was broken for a month or so while they were busy fixing the software so that it would work again. And uh, I've got a couple of you know Evernote files or something like that from those days that are a couple hundred links or whatever that I'm probably never going to put in the brain. And the only funny thing that happens is that every now and then, something will be in one of those files that I thought I put in the brain because I did like half the act of, of, of remembering it. But then I go look in the brain and it's not there. So not a, not a big deal, but it's interesting. Yeah, it is. So do you find that it's not workable to use it with iPad with a pad? I, I find that uh, authoring on the iPad is not functional. Uh, it's, it's, it, I can do it. And in fact, the sync works. So it's syncing through the web brain server. Yeah. Uh, so the iPad will sync properly and I'll see it again here on my laptop but I have not figured out a quick way to author in the iPad. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and it's, use, it's kind of useless on a phone. It, the phone is just too tiny. Too tiny, you can't read it. Yeah, it's pretty on an iPad, and I don't have a 12-inch iPad, but I imagine on a 12-inch iPad, it's probably gorgeous, because that's, that's just a lot of screen real estate. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or thoughts on, on this part? Mm -hmm. um, Harry, so, have, is this available for us to look at? Uh, you can browse my whole brain for free at jerrysbrain.com. Okay. So just go to, let's, let me type it into the chat real quick. Uh, bup, bup, bup. Oh, that's right. I'm in, I'm in screen sharing mode, so I've got to figure out how to get the chat up. There's the chat. Okay. So uh, if you go to jerrysbrain.com, there's a link that says launch Jerry's Brain. Mm -hmm. Just go there, and uh, that will launch this. It, uh, it, it will launch it with a vertical line through the middle, which I can't change. I can't change the default launch format, which is too bad. You have to learn to change it around so that it's easier to see, because I, I, I move my screen around so that I see like the, the whole uh, blue part of the brain. It occupies most of my, most of my uh, screen real estate. <clears throat> but you can go browse this. Uh, you can go find yourself and, uh, and any, you know, any other kinds of things. So here's a, a Center for Social Change, Bill Burdett, member of Rex under, and in fact, I should, uh, I should attach the Center for Social Change to Social Change, which I'm pretty sure I have a, a thought for. Mm -hmm. And uh, Social Change is then connected to a whole bunch of stuff. <laughs> and it's connected to scales of change, which then comes back to uh, personal change, systems change, technological change, organizational change, et cetera, et cetera. So. so there's a balance here, Jerry, between you curating what's interesting to you and you being encyclopedic. Yeah, I feel sometimes like I'm Cliff Claverin gone amok in a bad Stephen King novel, Yeah, <laughs> um, which, which is maybe the the dark side of, of doing this and being this, but you know what, I, I, I'm, I'm okay with that. <laughs> and and it, if I'm at a conference, like I'm sitting in the audience, I'll be looking in my brain and if there's a side chat of the conference, which I love, I'll be posting links from the next speaker, right? So somebody goes up, uh, Parag Khanna is coming up on stage 
And uh, meanwhile, I'll be sitting there basically saying, oh, I know Parag. I mean, I've not met him personally, but look, he wrote How to Run the World. He wrote Hybrid Reality. He wrote Technocracy in America. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a Bernard Schwartz fellow at the New America Foundation, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so I can, I can put, I can put, I can harvest any of these individual links. The, I can also go up and say, Hey brain, give me, um, give me a web thought URL. So this is how I send somebody a unique link to a thought in my brain. So if I say copy web thought URL, or in this case, also uh, command shift T, uh, it will copy to my clipboard. Well, that's interesting. My, my pad just disconnected. It will copy a link to my clipboard that I can then paste in a chat. Let's go back to our chat here. Mm -hmm. um, I'm running version 10. Mm -hmm. I'm on the latest, I'm on the latest rev of the brain. Yeah. So I can, I, so that gives me a short link that will take you directly to that spot in my brain, mm -hmm. which is really handy, except you may have to wait 60 seconds to get there because mm -hmm. it's kind of slow. Mm -hmm. um, so the next place I wanted to go was, um, let me see which one, where, where do I want to go? Uh, So uh, a slightly more controversial thought that is in my, in my beliefs <clears throat> is, uh, is trauma necessary for greatness, for people to achieve greatness. <clears throat> and if you look at the biographies of uh, most of the North American abstract artists, a whole bunch of novelists and poets, uh, a, a lot of people who created great works, many of them had really torturous childhoods. <clears throat> so here's unresolved childhood trauma. Um, <clears throat> here's, you know, bios of abused people. I think I have another, here we go. The thought I'm looking for is people who had traumatic childhoods. There should be a lot more listed under here um, than because it's, it's I, I think it's kind of an epidemic. Um, and that's a bit more um, controversial than we should have global unity or the, a, a belief in some kind of intertwingularity. Uh, but it informs how I think about what's happening because I also believe in sort of systemic trauma, basically that um, a lot of things we do as part of socialization are in fact, you know, inflicting subtle kinds of trauma on us uh, in different ways. Uh, so one of my sources there is Alice Miller, uh, who is a, was a psychotherapist uh, based in Switzerland who survived the Warsaw Ghetto uh, and is in my list of contrarians who make or made sense, which is one of my favorite spots in my brain. This is where I collect thinkers uh, whose work, thinkers and doers, whose work has influenced the way I see the world. And oh, Alice. Oh, Jerry, what was the name of the, the man that Alice Miller was writing about in her works? Because he was a, a writer, Herman, not, um, Herman I, don't, I don't remember, but in any event, he, he should be listed on one of your, you know, trauma people. In other words, that was the whole basis of her work. Uh, he may well be. Which Herman... Uh, let me try and see if I can find it. Do you remember in which book? Uh, the main book, the main book that she had. Um, so you know, the drama of the gifted child? Right, exactly. Uh, I, so the drama of the gifted child goes back so far for me that I don't have it very well annotated in my brain. Um, therefore, I haven't really connected it <clears throat> in, in the ways that I ought. But if you can find out who that is, I will add that. Yeah, I'll find it and send it to you because it really sort of like started her whole work. Primarily yeah. because of the fact that he himself did not uh, really sort of project that it was a trauma. And yet she was saying that that's part of the problem is that he was excusing his parents for abusing him. And, and in a way didn't even acknowledge that he was abused. That makes total sense. It does make sense. Yep. And that's well, the maternalization of not okayness too, that, I mean, most everyone who has a trauma, the first place they go is shame, I must have caused this somehow. Yeah, exactly. So um, in, in Thou Shalt Not Be Aware, Alice talks about how Freud, so Alice is one of the few people who got access to the Freud archives. Another one is Jeffrey Musayef Mason, who himself is controversial. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, but in going through the archives and looking at uh, Alice Miller's early cases, she discovered that uh, one of the earliest things he got famous for was the study of hysterics. 
And it, it was six or eight women who were basically kind of catatonic, uh, which back then they called hysteria. And it turned out that um, all of these women had been abused by their fathers. And it turned out that Sigmund Freud realized that there was no way he could go out into polite Viennese society and say so. He couldn't report, hey, this is what I've discovered. So he invents drive theory. He basically invents out of whole cloth the, the Oedipus complex, the Electra complex, all of those kinds of things. Um, he, he kind of invents them. And that, those become psychological dogma. Those become what we do. And if you think about it, what does the, uh, what does the Oedipus complex do but reinflict the, dra the trauma on the child? It accuses the child of trying to divide the father and the mother, et cetera, et cetera. So she's trying to say, hey, we have, we have like completely covered over um, what happened here. And, and in the 80s, I watched as this, this notion started to actually bubble up. And there were some cases of people who were um, suing their parents for abuse, et cetera, et cetera. And then I watched the immune system, the social immune system, basically uh, come up and invent uh, repressed memory syndrome, false memory syndrome, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, here is uh, Peter Fried is one of the people. Uh, there are a bunch of people who basically created a foundation and they basically said, nope, none of this really happened. This is a form of gaslighting. So I should probably, um, I should probably connect it to gaslighting. Mm -hmm. And a small, a small side uh, trip that you guys might enjoy. So gaslighting is denying things that ever, denying that things ever happened. It comes from a play <clears throat> call it titled Gaslight, written by Patrick Hamilton, in which a husband drives his wife crazy by messing with her memory. Right. right? So that's, that's why we really say gaslighting. Movie, movie yeah. was under like Bergman and uh, what, Charles Bergman. Right, right. <clears throat> exactly. And uh, so uh, I have gaslighting under Trump's favorite tactics. So I have... Uh, uh, Absolutely. <laughs> I, have, I have cataloged as best I can, right? And clearly this is not exhaustive and the categories aren't clean, but uh, you know, hey, he, he makes sure people think he might just be crazy enough to do that. Uh, he invents numbers to suit his story. He makes sure he gets free airtime because he's so controversial. Uh, deny everything that's damaging. Distract people from paying attention to significant matters. Claim victory in defeat. Claim you don't know people you know really well. Like, you know, whatever. Tons of examples. But, Always but um, everything. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, uh, puffery, basically. Yeah, promote yourself at every opportunity, uh, promise something, uh, make grandiose claims puff because puffery is legal, you know, and, and he's really good at using the law by skirting the law. Basically do mm -hmm. things that are completely outrageous, but yet not, just barely not illegal uh, over and over again. By the way, Scott Adams of Dilbert fame has been chronicling these tactics for years. So, uh, you should take a look at that. So in fact, if I type in, sorry, my, between Zoom and the brain and everything else is slowing down a little bit now, but I have a thought, yeah. funny yeah. enough, title, Scott Adams on Trump. Great, you're there, okay. Where, where Adams, uh, mm -hmm. who's a real contrarian here, mm -hmm. um, he basically said, hey, look at Trump from the perspective of persuasion techniques and the seduction community and all those kinds of things. It turns out that Trump is a, map, is a black belt. He's an absolute master of persuasion. And Adams goes and does a close reading, roughly, of mm -hmm. some Trump speeches and says, look, how he's, you know, how he's repeating the same point six times over. And he's, it sounds like he's an idiot and he's like talking to idiots. But it turns out that if you repeat something over and over again, it sinks in and, it, you know, the message carries. So uh, Scott Adams was one of the people who uh, predicted uh, Trump victory. Uh, along with Michael Moore, Mark Stallman, Mark Bly, David Burstein, David Betras, uh, the, the Daybreak poll got it that, that they were going to win uh, an IA, sorry, uh, an, uh, an election prediction service predicted that he was going to win, et cetera. And I'm sure there are many, many others that I didn't catch, but this is my little bag of, of who understood ahead of time that Trump was likely to win. Who, who got that something was very different what was happening. So then I went and read and listened to a lot of what these people said, which then led me to, fig, you know, to, to do, post some videos after the election that, about how I'd changed my mind on things. And, and I'm, I'm really interested in changing my mind. 
I don't think I'm easy to change my mind. I don't think I'm quick to, to, to vacillate on stuff. But part of the reason why I post my beliefs, and this goes back to sort of this, this conversation about vulnerability, is that I want to I want to say out loud the things that I believe so that as we dive deeper into layers of conversation, I can say, yes, but aren't people generally born good? Right? Or some other sort of thing. And at least we can have that conversation. And then maybe we locate the place where we agree to disagree. So if somebody else is like very Hobbesian and they think, no, 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 people are, people are born evil and we just have to, we have to build institutions and create systems to stop them from doing evil, as opposed to the people are generally born good and we should build institutions to maximize genius and then deal together and very flexibly with the evil that shows up. Those are two completely different ways of building institutions, right? They're, they're two completely different approaches to how life works, how people work, the whole thing. And I think that conversation is super interesting. And I'm perfectly happy to talk with people who, who have opposite opinions. I just wish more of us made it more explicit so that when we sat down, we could figure out where are our points of agreement, where are our points of disagreement. Let's go buy a nice bottle of wine and go have a good conversation about the places where we disagree. And then I, I, I can be swayed. Terry, can you hear me? Go ahead, Ken, yeah. I, I want to throw something in around people being born good or evil. Please. When I, was on, I was on Bali in 2006 for a Quest for a Global Healing Conference, and I got a tour of this big temple, and the guide said, you'll notice we have a place here for cockfighting and gambling. <coughs> we believe that these, are, these kinds of vices are inherent in people. You can't wipe them out. We have a god called Barak, which is the god of good evil. And mm. if, if you make offerings to the God of good evil, you keep the God of bad evil away. So if you try to wipe it out, like the Puritans want to wipe everything out, right? That would be totally pure. Then, um, then you end up having really bad things come about. But if you say, okay, there's always going to be gambling. There's always going to be people who want to, you know, sex work, right? So we allow, we make that as safe as possible. And wow. maybe we don't actually promote it, but we, we, we don't try to wipe it off the face of the planet and then you get um, a much different kind of society than one that is constantly trying to eradicate the, the root of evil. Do you remember the, how to spell the name of the God? I think it's B-A-R-A-K, but I'm not mm -hmm. entirely sure. So I was just trying to find God of the God of good evil. That didn't work. Yeah. Let me try Barak. Uh, God is good for you. Nope. Barack and God massacre the Canaanites. Oh, I will. I will try and find out. I've got. I. I still know people from the Bali Institute for Global Renewal. I'll, I'll see if cool. I can find out from. I'd them. love to because that's exactly the kind of thing I'd love to put in my brain. And that's the kind of insight. I mean, uh, I'm really interested in institutional design, which sounds super boring, except it drives most of society and culture, mm -hmm. right? Super interested in institutional design, and making room for the dark side rather than trying to squash it out of existence mm -hmm. is incredibly important and doing so in a way that people can coexist with really matters right and, and this goes down to prohibition and the legalization of pot and whether prostitution should be legal and the whole whole you know there's a whole angle of things there um and another thing that i've put out there is uh, back when sort of the, the main umbrella for my work was the Relationship Economy Expedition or Rex, I created a thought called the Rex Platform, right? And the Rex Platform says, let's eliminate the Electoral College, let's legalize gay marriage, let's legalize prostitution, let's abolish patents, uh, let's create a U.S. Department of Peace, let's eliminate the, de the Department of ed Education and Agriculture, let's reform the, the spectrum, let's stop corporate welfare, let's reverse corporate power, including corporate personhood, uh, let's get rid of the farm bill. Let's get rid of agricultural subsidies. These are all things that, it, like, if somebody gave me a magic button and made me king, I would just go do these things. Um, and, I, and, and I'm not sure I'm 100% on each of these, but I feel pretty strongly about them. Interesting. I'm just, I'm just sort of re-familiarizing myself with the list right now, just looking at it with you. It's very funny. And I haven't visited this node in my brain in quite a while. So partly looking at this makes me think, oh, okay, I should come back and do a little more gardening, right? Mm -hmm. And makes me think, gosh, was I too 
optimistic about this one or like, do I really believe that one or how, do, you know, how does that work? Mm -hmm. um, and then, so under here, like Direct's platform revitalizing cities is, is, is a really lovely nexus. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very nice place. This is just the A through Ds because there's a scroll bar down here. So you'll see there's a lot more here. This is all um, initiatives, books, articles, TED Talks, whatever about uh, people who've really been rethinking cities in, in interesting ways. Uh, so it includes uh, the edible landscapes of Todd Morton in Northern England. Uh, so here's foodscaping, edible landscapes. Here's Pam Warhurst's talk, uh, how we can eat our landscapes. Uh, uh, she did a TEDx way back when. It's under revitalizing cities. Uh, and then, you know, the way they make it inclusive is they say, if you can eat, you're in. <laughs> That's one of their little uh, code words. And then another talk I really love is Jason Roberts, the inventor of Better Block. Uh, and he gives an excited talk uh, way back around the same time, actually. So all of these I collect up because should anybody be looking for ways of making cities better, I'm, I mean this to be a resource for them. So Jerry, do I get to grab your revitalized cities um, uh, cascade and clone it into my brain? I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to copy a bunch of things. Uh, you'd have to sort of choose how many you know, degrees to go from. Right. I don't really know how to do that. It's not possible as far as I know. Okay. This is part of the brain's limitation is that the servers each live in a separate instance and don't know how to talk to each other, which I would not have done. Because that would be crazy awesome if we could actually do some brain merging. So I can give you a link to this thought right now. So here's, so copy web thought URL. I'm gonna paste this into our chat right this second. So that's easy. Mm -hmm. and, you can, and you can add that link into your brain or other tool and say, hey, here's a link to, um, you know, uh, to interesting stuff that somebody curated. That, mm -hmm. works, e that works easily. Yeah. But the rest of what you're looking for, which I would like as well, yeah. don't know how to do. Okay, have you asked them? Of course. Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. Other thoughts? Would, would any of you put your beliefs out in this way? Is this, a, is this feel like an unnatural act or a natural act or a useful act or a use, a useless act? I'm interested. I think That's it's a useful out. act. What I'm curious is, do you have um, uh, a range in which you say, okay, these are really firmly held beliefs. I, I've, I've, you know, really been rigorous with this, and yet it's got to be have to be something to change that would have to be really of a large magnitude. These are kind of still developing beliefs, and these are the ones I'm not quite sure of. Is that part of your strategy? I have not done that. The only way to discover that really is to investigate how fleshed out or thought out do they appear to be, because I have more and less evidence on some of these, and you know, uh, so forth, uh, or to, or to talk to me and ask me directly. So that there's no. I, I could use a coloring scheme, you know, I could use intensities of color on the, on the different nodes, but I have definitely not done that. It's, it's an interesting idea. I just, I just didn't know how to implement it consistently. Go ahead, Judy. Well, it seemed when, when I was on this that, it, that some of the elements of what you have in your fundamental truths and your canons um, does create that hierarchy of the ones that have coalesced to be stronger than the individual elements. That's actually really true. And the intention, thank you for discovering those and mentioning them right now because I had forgotten I'd put them in here. Um, because I did this so that I could say, how do I simplify? And one thing that's not connected here um, that matters a lot to me is, um, and I don't, did we even go through this in the last call? Yeah, we did because I talked about the 10 commandments, right? Right. And I went to deep listening and loving speech. <clears throat> And to me, um, deep listening and loving speech is also needs to be connected to my fundamental truths, because if we if we sort of drive that way, a lot of other good things happen. Mm -hmm. So so here we are. So we shouldn't harm children. Uh, God is in everyone, which is comes to me out of Quaker uh, thinking. Uh, there's plenty of there's plenty of other belief systems that believe God is in everyone. Uh, yeah. The one that the one that informed me is Quaker thinking, which mm -hmm. I love. Um, about the inner light, about being silent together. You, you know, one of their sayings I use all the time in my retreats, you should only break the silence to improve on it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but, but by the way, uh, Quakers were 
essential to the development of a whole bunch of things, including the Industrial Revolution. Um, it's, it's super interesting. The, the history of like the British confectioners and wool, British woolens and confectionery early on were Quaker. Uh, there's a book called Quakers, Money and Morals, uh, which should be under articles about Quakers. Here we go. This book basically talks about how um, Quakers, mm. partly, um, partly because they were outcasts, right? There's, there's a certain silver lining to being cast out of society. And you can see this in Judaism, you see this in a lot of different places where persecution kills you or makes you stronger in some ways or forces you into things that other people are rejecting. So um, the Industrial Revolution starts when people like Quakers are clearly not gonna be in the clergy or the aristocracy or the mercantile trades or the professions. In fact, they're being driven out of town. So a lot of innkeepers at the crossroads become Quakers. A lot of biologists who go on sailboats around the world and send back seeds to Kew Gardens and other places are Quakers because you're getting as far away from you know, Mother England as you, as you possibly can. But also the Quakers look around and they say, what is, what's up with this machine for lifting, uh, lifting earth by fire? you know, the early steam engine. And they're like, well, let's see if we can't make some use of that. And nobody else wants to touch it. There's no reason for it. It doesn't have enough power to do much of anything. And, and last little sort of uh, link here, um, the cost of coal at the coal face is zero. And the coal mines are having a trouble with flooding. Um, and then there's another link here, which is uh, one of the reasons, oh, this is actually interesting. Um, let me go to coal and see if I can find this thread. Um, so Britain is really um, quick to the Industrial Revolution because it has coal, it had coal right out by the surface and it was easy to access. But once they started digging it out, they started having flooding problems. And the first steam engines were like the Newcomen pump were used for uh, pumping water out of coal mines. And the cost of fuel at a coal mine is zero because you're just chopping it out of the wall. Uh, and it's not until much later that you can make steam engines efficient enough to drive a train and put it on tracks and move freight, et cetera. That, that comes a whole bunch later. But the Quakers see this early tool and start to harness it for moving mills instead of water wheels, instead of you know, other kinds of power at the time. Long, long digression, sorry, but I, I find this stuff really fascinating. Mm -hmm. Jerry, the person in, in Alice Miller's book was Herman Hess. Oh, okay. Well, of course, yeah. Oh. So I was wondering whether you meant Herman Hess, and I don't think I have the connections properly made to, um, to Alice. So I will, I will make a note to myself to go explore that. And she used him because of the fact that she really couldn't use legitimately, in other words, legally, her own clients, and so she used somebody who was notorious, in other words, who had, a lot of people had written about, and he had written a, a lot about, and his parents had written about. So she was able to piece together both his abuse and his denial of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, that's, that's awesome. And if you, have, if you know of any articles or books that point to this particular narrative, I'd love to know that. And I'd also love to know the, the Barack story of good evil. Uh, Ken, if you, can, if you can find that, I'll uh, send it to me or put it on the, just put these things on the Inside Jerry's Brain list and I will harvest from there and, and drop them back in my brain. But I'll, I'll do my own research on these as well. Okay, I can send you an article in a book review that, that gets into this. Fabulous, right. that's perfect, thank you. Uh, and it's interesting because Alice Miller is herself very controversial. Um, what, what's, What's, what's interesting to me is that some of these people who have contrarian views are in fact really controversial because they're contrarians, right? And what they're saying can't be stomached by other people. And contrarians are really, really close to wild ass, totally ridiculous conspiracy theorists. There's not that much distance between them all the time. So you, you've got to figure out what, fi what fits the model. What is your filter? When, when is somebody a contrarian with a really useful point of view? And when is somebody just wacko with a point of view you kind of need to, need to skirt around? Um, and, and when is it not just a, a, a kind of a self-referential affirmation? Yes. And also, there's some people like Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber, whose, whose critiques of society are pretty on. 
right? A lot of people are pointing to the Unabomber's manifesto as, hey, this was actually pretty literate and pretty dead on about stuff, even though he was busy mailing bombs to people and hurting people. Um, so one of the things I'm discovering is that, and, 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 and this is where I need, I, I could use your guidance or your language or your own experience on this. Um, how, to, how to find your way to, how to find your way to listen to people who many other people are just not listening to. Uh, and I'll give you an example here. So Steve, Steve Bannon um, is now seen as sort of the antichrist by a whole lot of people on the left and other sorts of places, right? Uh, and he's, he's no longer in the Trump White House. Maybe, thank God, maybe not, because now he's got a lot more freedom. So I have, I have a thought in my brain called Bannon in the Trump administration under articles about Bannon. Uh, and here's the you know, New York Times articles about the fall of Steve Bannon, is he being forced out, uh, blah, 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 blah. But uh, there was an interview that Bannon did uh, with Zanny Minton, Zanny Minton Beddoes, uh, who is a writer at The Economist. Uh, and uh, so here's her, uh, uh, her Twitter handle, but there's this interview that's online at YouTube, here's the link. And, uh, uh, and I wrote to myself as a note uh, of that, that Beddoes does not manage this argument well. She's trying to sort of, it's a little bit like the now infamous argument with uh, uh, Jordan Peterson uh, and the journalist, where Peterson basically walks all over this journalist who's trying to pin him down. And I, yeah. I disagree with Jordan Peterson, but it's super interesting to watch as a, as a conversation. But here, Bannon says, hey, look, the party of Davos took care of themselves and let the devil take the hindmost. And he coins this party of Davos thing. He, that, that's one of his, you know, uh, one of the ways you can control dialogue in the public sphere is to coin a lot of things that other people then adopt. So he says the party of Davos uh, also brought on the global financial crisis and the rise of China. So I'm gonna link these two. Um, and I'm going to link uh, causes So I have a thought, I know I have a thought called causes of the global financial crisis. So all I had to type right now is causes glob. And because I know what I put in my brain, I realized nobody else ha has that, you know, that, that full perspective. But because I knew that, now I just type the down arrow, hit return, and I've now made a link with causes of the global financial crisis, which as you'll see, <clears throat> is quite complicated, has a bunch of stuff connected to it, uh, which is connected to causes of the subprime crisis, which has its own set of, of questions and issues, et cetera, et cetera. So now back to Bannon's assertions. Um, so I learned a tremendous amount about the populist, nationalist movement that Bannon is trying to create because he now has a movement called The Movement, which he is recruiting. Um, so here's Matteo Salvini is in it. Michel Mondrikamen is in it, who is from the People's Party in Belgium. He's basically trying to unify the global shift to the far right which is a thought I have as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I learned a ton of the logic behind why this might be appealing to people by paying attention to Bannon, mm -hmm. who is not on my list of contrarians who make sense. I'm not, to me, that's an elevation that I don't want to give him, but he's, a, he's, he's like not an idiot. Well, Absolutely not the, an idiot. Part of the challenge right now is that there are a lot of, um, Adjectives fail me. People who are rather effective at pitching a particular viewpoint that's ungrounded in scientific fact or business fact or other things, strictly from a point of appealing to people and taking advantage of a high skill set in persuasion and influence and communication tactics to sway large numbers of people. In a, in a society where we have not embraced the fact that everyone needs to develop the skill sets to respond to those. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we were to try to elevate society as a whole, somehow we would start in the kibitz level of education with validation and self-esteem and openness and vulnerability leading to trust because it's safe to do those things. Yeah. And then that evolves into a self-actualized person who yeah. is... So Judy, not only are you exactly right, but Mr. Bannon understands that you're exactly right because his cronies have been fighting a battle against critical thinking in education for decades. Exactly. And, and that's probably 
um, right up there with positive elevation of connectivity mm -hmm. is deterioration of critical thinking in education as one of the greatest flaws, woes of our society today. And it doesn't take much to get me on a pulpit about it. And with other educators who share that, um, to talk about specific tactics in sort of every social situation where those of us who value critical thinking can in a, I don't want to say a sneaky way, but in a, in a non-confrontational way, invite critical dialogue, which I think is where some of this is heading, Gary, when you talk about things in context, is that in order to reach critical thinking dialogue, you have to be aware of your own thoughts, but open to other thoughts that are contrarian that allow you to then connect with the person of contrarian viewpoint and actually have a meaningful dialogue. Absolutely. And that's a skill set that can be taught, but it's not taught in school. And the mm -hmm. fundamentals of questioning fact aren't taught in school. I had a, 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 a sort of a epiphany moment in grad school in traditional sense, people presented articles from science and over summarized them and the group discussed them and critiqued and so forth. And in one of these in my early years, the professor who was not my major professor, but I was in his listening group because I needed more context of his stuff, said something to the presenter like, do you believe that? And there was dead silence in the room because no one had asked themselves that question. And he said, you need to understand that science is just our best approximation. Every time you read something, you should ask yourself if you believe it. Is it supported? Why do you believe it? You know, things in your chemistry books are pretty much true or the best model we have because they've been tested over and over and over and over and over. But you're going to see literature that hasn't been tested rigorously. Mm -hmm. And that was an epiphany for me. I mean, I'd always been a little contrarian by personality because I was like the why kid. Why, 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 why drove my parents nuts. Um, but we're not teaching that. We're not encouraging kids to ask those questions. We're not even encouraging adults to ask those questions. And that's pretty scary. So I just want to pick up on, on one of the threads. I love what you're saying. I want to pick up on one of the threads that kind of crossed through here, which is, I'm a, I'm a big critic of the compulsory education system. I do not like standard schooling. I think, in fact, it causes and reinforces many of the problems we're talking about. It undermines critical thinking, and then we wonder why we don't have critical thinkers, but we've built an institution that was created to create good consumers and factory workers and dumb people down. So one of my heroes, one of my contrarians who make or made sense is John Taylor Gatto, who died just recently. <clears throat> and... Um, he was, you know, he, he turned into a cranky bastard in his old age, which happens a lot to contrarians because your whole field is sort of turned against you and you have a few people who are cheering for you. But um, he, you know, he wrote a book called Dumbing Us Down, uh, among many other things. In fact, my first exposure to, to John Taylor Gatto is, uh, where is it? Here we go. Is this essay called The Six Lesson School Teacher that Doc Searles uh, sent me in the mail because it was published in Sun Magazine, which is a subscriber published, uh, you know, articles magazine. And uh, basically, uh, Docs mails me this and I read the six lesson school teacher in which, in which Gatto says, you know, nominally I was your high school English teacher. Let me tell you what I was really teaching you. And he talks about the hidden curriculum of schooling um, about which I've become a whole lot wiser. And so we wonder why we don't have critical thinkers but then we think, oh, let's just put that in the curriculum of school. And to me, that, well, that's a dog that won't hunt, right? So, so to me, we actually need to fix schooling uh, in a different way. And I'm uninterested in taking down the bureaucracies in school. I'm super interested in building um, a way people can learn of any age, learn any topic mm -hmm. at with minimal cost together. And to me, that, that falls under design from trust and it's one of the, the things I'd like to flesh out. And, and I, I bought the domain uh, I, I, just for fun. I have a, a website at learn.net, <clears throat> l3rn.net. I have very little up there right now, but this is kind of a, a project for Design from Trust that I would like to put in the world mm. and go do something with whoever wants to show up. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay. I like that. I mean, I, I think that the 
there's, there's certain um, teaching mechanisms of very intelligent, thoughtful people who do create this continuous learning dialogue and the curiosity. And if you're wondering about that, go look it up, um, go find it. Some of us, I mean, I, I didn't know there was a name for what happened to me when I didn't track with the rest of the class because I was a couple, a couple years ahead in school um, and bored out of my gourd. So I lived in the library all the time and I'd end up with all these books stacked around me because one thought would lead me to another question. I'd go find another book and I'd bring that back to the table. And, and this was like grade school behavior. And we don't allow that to happen in schools. Everybody has to sit in chairs and do the same thing and perform exactly the same tasks that other people around them are doing, which is not how any natural organism learns. A friend of mine's uh, first grader was disciplined for being just too fidgety in class. And that, that was her cue to pull the kid from school, do something else. Right, and another family, um, their daughter came home from maybe kindergarten and started telling them how to organize like the, the knives and forks at the dinner table, but, but not in a, hey, I learned some etiquette and here's how, but rather in a, this is how we do things kind of way. And they're like, whoa, whoa, what just happened to our kid? Yeah. <clears throat> so, so the system is designed uh, to break curiosity and, and uh, to break this, this, this sort of natural linkiness between things doesn't fit well when you have math class, then science class, then English class, right? And then we don't teach you common sense stuff, like how to live and how to have a relationship and how to be honest. And all that stuff is not actually in the curriculum. It's, it's just, it's a mess. And we not only eat your childhood with this, but we're extending childhood, right? Adolescence is a novel term. Um, one of the things that I love about Gatto is that he collects up stories of, um, of autodidacts and uh, sort of self-taught people and also young people who did really amazing things. And uh, one of his favorite people is uh, Farragut, um, who was our first admiral. Oops, I think it's, it's David Farragut, not John. Uh, so here we go. So, uh, and I'm giving away a little bit of my, 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 pl my plot here because um, I used to say in speeches that Farragut was put on board a ship at age 12, uh, a warship. Right, because that's what you did with kids who were sort of of the aristocracy of the navies of the time. It turns out he was put on board a warship at age nine. At age 12, he got his first command of a ship because the, cap the captain of his ship had actually taken a, a prize, a ship, uh, an opposing ship as prisoner, and he needed that prize to be sailed to the nearest port. And he, he puts Farragut on, in charge of the prize and, and uh, the captain of the captured ship says, I, I'm not going any place with a 12 year old steering. And Farragut says, uh, you know, if, if he shows his face above decks, have him shot. And on, on we go to our first major admiral, you know, uh, in America. But, but young people are actually extremely capable, but we keep, we keep creating this narrative that no, 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 our brains form really late and blah, blah, blah. We, keep, we keep extending childhood in ways that make it much easier to sort of control people's lives, I think. So again, this is, this is editorial for me about which I can then show you evidence in my brain. Just uh, throwing a little plug. Sorry, go ahead. You think about times when lifespans were shorter, people had to come of age sooner and live their lives sooner. Uh, and in, um, fact, in fact, many of the founding fathers were like 17 to 21 years old. So in fact, that's mostly true, except for one thing I'll take issue with, which is a conventional wisdom that we used to live really short lives and now we're living longer lives. And I just posted about this on Twitter. It turns Ooh. out that it turns out that infant mortality used to be huge, really, really bad. And what that mm. does is that skews how long you think people are living. But mm. it turns out that that human lifespans have been about the same for millennia. That that mm. if you look back in the fossil record and whatever, you'll find 70 and 80 year olds among the cave people, among other people, people were able to live a long age. Um, April and I were in Tanzania and we did a little safari and we had Maasai guide, you know, uh, walk us around and we had lunch and then he took a twig from a tree and brushed his teeth with a twig mm -hmm. and he had better teeth than I have. Mm -hmm. And that was just a habit passed down through millennia. He just like crushed the end of the twig a little bit. So it was kind of brushed like boom, 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 done. And I'm like this idea that we used to live only till 25 or 30. And then, you know, now we, we suddenly get a longer, I'm trying to dispel but I completely agree with you 
that way back when you had significant uh, partly this is connected to the way we used to be raised by the village like you would get graduated responsibilities as you got a little older so you know when you're five or six you, you know your your mom says go borrow some flour from the people next door when you're nine or ten go watch the, the goats for the afternoon when you're 11 or 12 why don't you go help build the house that we're building for uncle bob Mm -hmm. Right. And in doing so, everybody in the village gets to know who you are, you form identity, you build skills, you get graduated responsibility. And by the time you're 14, you're pretty capable doing most everything that everybody, every adult is doing. And people know you're a known quantity in the community, all of that, all of these methods we've destroyed. Like, like they exist still fragmentarily in different communities that protect it, but mostly we now get dropped in an institution, pop out of that institution with a degree and a grade or a rank, which is supposed to be a proxy for all this other rich stuff that I'm just describing and is not, fails completely to be that proxy. And then our employers treat us as a completely new, unique individual who's being represented by this resume, which is ridiculous as well. well not only that, but then in adulthood, the same thing happens with the, these are the things you can do at this level. If your questions go beyond that level too soon, it's not appreciated, it's discounted or found to be annoying um, in case, unless you have happen to have a particularly enlightened organization and some enlightened mentors who are like thrilled that someone's getting there faster and can maybe move further on this particular concept. And I think this notion of clustering and standardization is a, an abysmal failure because the spectrum of capability in any age group is extreme. I have a friend whose daughter's in a STEM school in fourth grade, and they have kids in the class in fourth grade with math skills between what they call grade two level and grade five level. And they have five different teachers teaching separate subgroups to help try to move them all along effectively. Whereas your community model allows people basically to do what they're capable of doing unless they screw up. And if they screw up, then someone says, we maybe shouldn't have had you do that yet, but there's no shame associated. It, the adult owns the fact that we let you do something that you maybe hadn't learned quite enough to do. So it's not a shaming thing to fail. You have instead the opportunity to maybe succeed at things people would never have guessed you were capable of doing. And we're just minimizing human potential instead of maximizing it, which just makes me want to vomit, basically. <laughs> what, what, if, what if vomiting is the natural reaction, in other words, the way that the system changes itself? I, I love the Buckminster Fuller concept that if a system isn't working right, stop flailing at it and go build another one and let it fail. Mm -hmm. One of the, the programs that we're supporting is called Learning One-to-One -One Foundation, which basically is homeschooling but creates the cur curriculum in the sky so that whatever it is that the school system says you're supposed to do, you'll get that done in five seconds and then go do whatever else you want. And there's a Sudbury school that basically has been doing that for 30 years, 40 years. And then Miami has just gotten their version of it down here. But what I'm getting at is that sometimes you have to let things fail, especially if they're institutional, in, in order to force the people to accept responsibility, in other words, the kid, in such a way that, that really, you know, that they're now motivated because they're in charge. They're the ones. I can remember having a dinner with uh, some families in, in Houston that were really struggling because their kids had gotten into addiction and this, that, and the other thing, and, and partially because of a very adverse reaction to the school. In other words, they just didn't like being in school. And I started talking about John Taylor Gatto's work, and they loved the title of his book, Weapons of Mass, Mass Instruction. Mm -hmm. And she said, wait, wait, wait. And she wanted to text the name of that book to her son, who was basically out of school because of addiction issues and everything, so that she could tell him, you're not wrong in making the school wrong. You know, you be who you want to be. Now, to my mind, and reading David Snowden's work on systemic, we're going into a period of, of distributed cognition. In other words, it's no longer hierarchical silos and everything, and we're being forced into more diversity, more use of, of varied forms of organization and everything, so it's more self-organizing. And to me, that's the, quote, systemic reaction to this problem. It's a serious, serious problem, but we're not going to solve it with a 
institutional response. You're right. I think that the, the, the disintermediation of education is a fascinating concept that's happening now because anybody can send an email to a professor anywhere in the world and start talking to him. And as long as it makes sense, the professor will probably be intrigued and answer. And this individual has skipped five filters to get to a direct connection with someone who can help with whatever they're trying to figure out. Right. So that's an important dimension. I thank you for putting a positive perspective on that, though, because occasionally I, I get really frustrated. It's part of our 500 year plan. Yep. We all do. Yeah. Um, Ken, and then I'd love to hear from Sky and Michael. I, I didn't even notice, Michael, that you joined the call because I've been in, in screen sharing view, so I didn't see you come in. Really glad you're here. But um, Ken and then whoever else would like to jump in. This is quick. Um, unfortunately, this is not widely available. It's only being shown in theaters at the moment. But there's a movie called Inventing Tomorrow, which uh, chronicles four groups of students or single students. One's from Hilo, Hawaii, a young woman from Bangor, India, a beautiful young woman from Indonesia, and three young men from Monterey, Mexico. And so this is outside for the most part American school systems. These are 16 and 17 year olds who are doing astonishing things. They go to this big um, uh, science conference sponsored by Intel in Los Angeles. The one that I found most intriguing was the three young men from Monterey, Mexico, which is a very industrialized and hugely polluted city. So these kids are saying, you know, how can we make things better? So we can't stop the pollution. We can't stop the industrialization. What can we do? They came up with a photocatalytic paint that mm -hmm. when put on bricks and struck by sunlight forms a water vapor barrier that actually pulls pollutants from the air and, trans and, and transmutes them into plant nutrients. So mm -hmm. it pulls pollutants out of the air and provides plant food. And it's, by, it's paint. It was really, I was like, oh my God, and these kids are 17. And it shows them in school with all this equipment, yeah. talking to their professors, professors saying, well, you got to test this. You know, it's, what, what about this and that? And it just, it came last Friday after being inside for over a week with the, with the smoke around here. And I went out and saw this. Oops, we've just lost your audio, Ken. It, was that Inventing Tomorrow? Was that the title? Inventing Tomorrow. Yes. Thank you. And I went to their website. It's not available on DVD. And the website's screwy. For such a brilliant film about science, they don't even list the showings in date order. So you have to kind of see, is it going to be near me? Hopefully, mm -hmm. it will be available more widely. But if you can get a hold of this, see it in some way, it, it will really give you a, a, a shot of adrenaline around, wow, you know, there's a lot of brilliant, capable young people that are, who are really looking at things in ways that are astonishing, and, and it will uplift you. So I want to throw that out. Thank, Thank you. you. And I, I have not heard of it, so I've just gone and I'll be putting it in my brain uh, shortly. But uh, Michael, Sky, do you guys want to jump in? Um, not so much jump. I'm, I'm um, just returning to being active. I've been keyboard averse for the last couple of months. Mm. Uh, seriously, you know, carpal tunnel and all that stuff. Mm. And um, this is a fascinating re-entry to, uh, to a rich context, uh, Jerry. I'm uh, really appreciating it. I'm going to dig into your brain a bit over the next few days and see what, uh, what I can find in there. I love but, hearing that. Look, look yourself up. You're, you're all over there. Am I? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. For sure. Thank you. No, thank you. I was particularly interested the other day in your comment about um, the expression of beliefs as an entry point for a conversation. And I've been uh, musing on that as, as uh, an opening gambit in this process. Can you say more about that? Yeah, well, um, yes, the, the sort of declaration of axioms. For instance, here's a quick check. Beliefs on money. Um, I hold these things to be common. We all use money, mm -hmm. hands up. Money, yep, use it all the time. Number two, we could all use some more. <laughs> Number three, we all know where it goes. Sometimes. Yeah, no. No, no, we do know where it goes. It goes away. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That is a function of conventional money. It isn't yours. You have no relationship to it. It is a relationship to you, but when you've spent it, it's gone. And the, um, 
that raises the issue of, okay, that's a form of money. It presents the proposition that there's nothing much we can do about that. That's endemic to its form. So can one create money that comes back? How would it work for me to have money that I could spend that would return to me? A circular economy based on my own provisions and activities. Mm -hmm. So that would be a belief structure that I'm exploring particularly at the moment and um, using as an entry point to find out um, where other people's beliefs and behaviors are about money. So, um, uh, do, you have this, do you have this written in a post, Michael? Because I, I just added a thought yeah, to the mention was about money. I'd love to enumerate uh, these beliefs uh, under that. Um, I will follow up on that, Jerry. At the moment, I'm in such disarray, it's, abs it's absurd. You know? so, um, um, thank you for being here. Really appreciate here. it. Well, I totally appreciate your work in this. It's, your brain is a wonderful thing. And carry on. Excellent. Mr. Skyler? Mr. Skyler? Well, <clears throat> I don't have much to say. Much to say. Michael, I'm, could you meet me? It's, it's interesting to see the brain here. Um, you turned me on to it a long time ago, and I've got a few things in it. So while you're talking, I'm also getting my brain to work here on the, on the, on the MacBook. But um, one thing, much of the, you've had the discussion about the brain this morning, and you had discussion about concepts. And one thing that's really interesting to me right now is working in non-conceptual, non-verbal areas. And so it was interesting to me to, to look at the brain and think, gee, how could I use this in the idiom of music um, to help me organize? Because that's the problem I have right now. As you know, I, I changed careers a few years ago. And right now, rather than shepherding words around, I'm shepherding thematic and textural materials in, in sound. And, um, you know, I've been using brain-like things since the 1980s. I think it was 1980 that... Um, about 82 that David Thornburg and some other people did their idea processor. They had the little light bulbs you would put on the screen and link them all up. So it was very much like the brain. And um, yeah, if you can look for David, maybe you can find that in there. Um, but I've been going from one brain to another over, what is that about 30 years, mm -hmm. you know, 35 years. And, um, this brain works as well as any of the others. Yeah, so what did you find there? I've got yeah, Thornburg, but I don't, I don't have his idea processor. Or what you're yeah, so about. that's interesting. Um, I'd have to look back, you know, it was like uh, in 1984, we had it on the Mac. Mm -hmm. Inspiration, um, it was called, wasn't it? it oh, was that inspiration? That sounds right. I remember the light bulbs. Yeah. At any rate, that's, that's all I've got to say. I mean, I'm sitting here in the snow and just kind of enjoying the, the conversation, but also, also thinking about it in like a completely flip side, different way of organizing things. Mm -hmm. Well, the metaphor of music, the actuality of music, not just a metaphor, but the connectivity of music is a, is a, a beautiful way to envision maximized communication because it brings in all the different voices um, with their own message, so to speak. And we take in a lot of our information auditorially anyway. So this would be a topic I'd love to have you talk about or lead us discussion on sometime in the future as a, the direction of uh, just a different way to look at things. Yeah, you know, as, as a composer, my goal, my goal is to take all those voices and orchestrate them so that they work properly. Right. And I work in a context where it is where everything is scored. Uh, and also there's the improvisational context as well. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm a musician as well, but sort of a lapsed one. I haven't been very active in recent years. But, yeah, I, there's, but there's no such thing as lapsed. And now the software will help you pick it up again. <laughs> really. I lapsed for 50 years. All right. Well, that's kind of where... Back in my 20s, my parents were very opposed to my pursuing something they perceived as no way to earn a living. Mm -hmm. And I'd had a lot of conditioning ahead of that about that didn't seem to acknowledge how much you actually used your brain to make music or art or other things. So there was this kind of hard line division between left-right brain concept, even though that's misnamed. Um, 
anyway, so it's, it's been an underpinning of my life forever, but fascinating that you actually made the jump back into it. I kind of left corporate life and science and went into art itself, you know, and then thinking how much I would have to practice to get back to the musical level I used to have. Well, that's true, but that's only true if you need to perform. Mm. That's true. So if performance is your issue, then you can use software now, and software can do an awful lot of things that you cannot do as a performer because you've lapsed. Mm -hmm. That's have you crazy. guys seen? Have you guys seen uh, loopers? Um, what are loopers? Sounds like a bad sci-fi movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's not. Uh, so. So there's a, a bunch of people now, uh, the funniest looper is Reggie Watts, who's got some priceless uh, performances online. But loopers are basically, it's, it's software with a bunch of buttons that lets you record uh, a, a, a measure and then just have it recorded and repeated and turn the measures on and off. Uh, you can sample, you, you, basically you're sampling yourself at first, either with an instrument. Uh, Zoe Keating does this with a cello very beautifully. Yep. Um, she layers, she loops and layers, right. Yep. And, and so what looping does is it lets you just get, get the next measure until it's right and then cut it in and out. So you're not actually performing live. Your performance is going between the different loops that you fed into whatever is cutting out live. And I, I think it's really, really powerful. So Zoe is really good at that. Another one you should add in there, Jerry, to explore is Amy X Newberg. N-E-W or N-E-U? N-E-W-B. Yeah, you are G. She makes a big deal of it, and I don't know which one it is. Sorry. Uh huh. But Amy, Amy X is, is the player. I have Amy X Wang. No, Amy X New. The Rolling Stone writer. So wrong person. Amy I mean, that's X. That's a big Wang. thing. There's a there are companies built on this. So Ableton has a product called yeah. Ableton Live that lets you loop and uh, actually adjust the tempo of things. I mean, we're a little off topic here, but it's- Well, you're not, not really not because- you, stuff. I mean, I think this is, in my mind, this is connectivity in a different form. It can be used for good purposes. It can be used for social change. It can arouse emotions or quell emotions. Um, it's incredibly powerful because it bypasses all of the cognitive stuff and goes directly to other sense areas. Um, so there's a lot of richness in the topic. I'm not. Yeah, and, and, we, and we play with that a lot. So right now I'm scoring one film and I've got three others that are waiting, you know, they're gonna get scored fairly soon. And that's exactly what I do is I look at the vocabulary that I wanna use. You know, I, I, I was on set as they were filming uh, all of last weekend. And my goal to be there was to understand what the, uh, what the actors were putting into the scene Mm -hmm. so that I can then modulate that to produce what the director wanted to produce. Okay. So it's thank the same vocabulary that you're talking about. Yeah, thank you for coming into the discussion, and I hope you will lead one of these discussions at some point. Mm -hmm. Great. Totally love that. And I just pasted to our chat uh, my favorite Ableton performance. You probably saw I was wandering around, and I, I sort of found it and picked it up. But there's a French DJ named uh, Madillon, and this thing is just a zoom on his hands and an Ableton deck. And he plays, he says something, I think the title of it is something like, these are my 31 favorite songs. And he then plays a composition that is mind blowing. It's lovely. Um, so happy about that. Um, we're getting close to the end of our call and uh, uh, Ken has nudged me that we're, we're, we haven't really gone through the, the trust and vulnerability conversation that much we've, we've wandered all over the place which i mm -hmm. love and i will point out also that for me this is a really high trust space like like i know that i i know that you guys are here and you'll go let you will go with the wander uh and i know that um i can go into topics that are difficult whether it's alice miller and you know childhood trauma or, or whatever and we'll work on it together and kind of resonate but um, I'd love to have us sort of go around here at the end of this call, and maybe this means we set up another call and go a little deeper into some aspect of this, because I think the topic is important. Um, I, think, I think sort of what I love about Brene's, uh, one of the phrases that I love about Brene's work, Brene Brown, is that vulnerability is the, the path to, to authentic connection and joy. Uh, and I'm sorry, can you say it again? Yeah, vulnerability is the path to authentic connection and joy.
Mm -hmm. uh, and what most people do is they want to avoid the vulnerable parts. They want to skip around it. They want to hide it. They want to not admit it. They want to just like park that someplace because it ain't good and it only makes you look weak and look bad. Uh, one thing I meant to mention at the, t at the top of this call is um, I created a little exercise that I ran with my insurance clients in Australia a couple years ago, which worked really well. Uh, first, I give everybody post-its and I say, hey, for three minutes, let's brainstorm on what, what does vulnerability mean to a company? Like picture yourself as executives at your company and uh, free associate on vulnerability. And mostly everything that comes up is about weakness and you know, corporate disaster and blah, 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 blah. And, and then I say, okay, great. Now take a new, new batch of post-its and talk about vulnerability in, in a relationship. What does it mean between humans? And most of the people uh, in the room were like, well, it's a good thing. It's, it's like, it's how you figure out that somebody's authentic. It's, you know, how you, a whole bunch of other sorts of things. And, and then we compared the two lists mm -hmm. uh, because one of my beliefs is that companies need to behave more like peers in the arena, not gods who give us the next thing we're going to buy and the next thing we're going to do. And then companies that can figure out how to show up as peers will be innately um, credible and authentic. And we'll have fans who don't need to be marketed to. You won't need, you won't need like, you won't need to pay advertisers a lot of acquisition costs to get new people to buy your crap. You'll actually develop stuff that is useful in people's lives, et cetera, et cetera. And you'll be in conversation with those people as you do it. Um, so part of our problem is that we see vulnerability as a, diff as a dangerous thing for organizations. So for a future conversation is the notion of vulnerability as a, as a, as a tactic or as an approach or as maybe much better word, an intention mm -hmm. for organizations. I, I, I like that a lot as well. So we let's, have, we have that ahead. old meme. We have that old meme of it's nothing personal, Jerry. It's only business. Exactly. And, and, well, also through, you know, through the 50s, 60s, 70s, the stereotypical era of mad men and big business, yep. um, your life and your personality and your preferences and your moral obligations were to be left outside the door. Absolutely. On, on purpose. That stuff had no business in the boardroom, had no business in the office, et cetera, et cetera. Even though that's also the era of men having three martinis at lunch and coming back and abusing women. But still. Um, yeah, so I, th I think we're in a healthier era now, and I I'm interested in these conversations. So let me just let me step back a bit and see what you all think of these. This resonates topics. for me with the thing you said earlier about Bali and the mm. temple. Mm -hmm. Another thread I'd like to see us pull or push or exchange or something is the notion of inner wisdom, that's intrinsic wisdom. It could be indigenous. <coughs> um, I don't know moral fiber, there's a host of uh, uh, labels that people put on it. But I think that many people, maybe even all people, possess internal wisdom, but it's been discounted or they've been taught to ignore it along the way. And I think that part of becoming more authentic is owning your weaknesses as well as your strengths and allowing that inner wisdom to surface and sort of giving yourself time to let it surface. I loved your comment last time, Ken, about putting any thought or plan aside for three days because you're going to think of things you didn't think of in the moment that will alter the direction you want to move. Um, and so I think as part of the authenticity and trust, exploring that dimension would be really interesting to me. I love that. I just posted to the chat that <clears throat> there's a, an essay or something that I want to create called SNP which talks about how we cut all of the, the ways in which we were connected to our intuition, in which people had long-term ties to community and outcome. I, I have a whole riff on the global financial crisis and the many different things that were snipped in the run-up to the GFC that mm -hmm. allowed the GFC to happen, that basically propelled it. And, and I haven't materialized this in a video or whatever, that's my intention. Uh, who else would like to go in? Ken, please. Yeah. Judy, I love what you're saying. Um, and also, Jerry, I want to amplify both of those points. I think as we head into the 21st century and we start to find our way to cope with all the wicked messes and wicked problems in front of us, trust and vulnerability becomes ever so much more important. You know, this idea of one person knowing it all is, is an obsolete idea, and yet it still seems to hold a lot of purchase and currency in, in many organizations and organizational settings. Mm -hmm. And the other side of that is... Um, uh, I'm often in meetings where people will, you know, well, let's set some ground rules and can we have confidentiality? 
And yet I have almost never seen that work. I have been in so many settings. People say, I'll be confidential, right? And then at lunch, you hear them saying to their, you wouldn't believe what so-and-so was saying. It's like, so I ask people not for confidentiality to make things safe. I ask them, what do we need to put in place to create a brave space where we're willing to step out and take a risk? And I think this shift from safe to brave spaces is another part of the, of the characteristic great that we're, we're attempting really to bring forth. Um, because to be vulnerable for me means to step out there and say, I don't know. I, I have a half-baked idea I want to put out here. You know, shoot it down. Don't shoot me down. Shoot the idea down. Say what's good about it. And being willing to step up and say to someone, you know, I, I, I think you will have not thought this through. I disagree, right? Those are all risky behaviors, and they require a, a willingness to set those conditions evoked from the group you're working with as opposed to imposed on them, but to, to gather yeah. them from the group. It, and it, it also requires a, a, a group commitment to the openness mm -hmm. to hear without judgment ideas that may differ from their preconceptions. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, one of the things that I worked on a decade ago in, in the ACS actually where I met Jerry was um, setting a code of, code of code of conduct, so to speak, for the board in terms of how we were going to behave in the board. It, it was not critical. It had no thou shalt not. It had all positive statements about listening respectfully to other people whose opinions were different or various things. It was very cursory, and, but it was, it was something they'd never done before. <laughs> and um, it was helpful because occasionally when something went off rail, somebody would pipe up, that's contrary to number five, John or something, <laughs> and it wasn't critical, it was just an observation, it wasn't a beat down. Um, but I think what you're talking about is really important in terms of creating the right environment for open trust and communication. Mm -hmm. Thanks. If, I, if I could just, uh, you know, the, you, you had framed this call as about trust, and I think we've been all over the map, but not directly chewing on that, so I'd love to do more of that next time. And it strikes me, something I've been observing a lot lately, is that there, we seem to be in a cultural movement that is privileging the mechanistic and the predictable. Um, and um, I may be biased or ignorant. I, 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 I tend to think of this more as a millennial mm -hmm. uh, tech phenomenon uh, and as part of what's the hunger behind AI is that you know, there are people who want to have everything kind of cut and dried and mechanistic and robotic so that we don't have to do this so that we don't have to have the sloppy and uncertain and vulnerable you know, emergence of stuff in human relationships. And I, I'm just increasingly feeling that that's a big undercurrent of conflict in our world today, is those two perceptions of how to live. Okay, Bill, go ahead, I see you. Had a functional <laughs> element of that. Um, part of what I'm sort of trying to work with is stuff related to the Monroe Institute and out-of-body experiences and everything. Mm -hmm. you know, create trust in me. In other words, when I hear the word wisdom, unfortunately, I, I sort of sense sometimes that people think that they're wise, but it's not coming from internal at all. Mm. And, and yet being comfortable with that. In other words, I hear a lot of people talk about, oh, we're going through this age, you know, this change in the new age, and, and we're all going to become more multi-sensory and more, more spiritual, etc. And, and yet some of the, the mechanics of that uh, even within the language of the Monroe Institute, is it no, this world is intentionally supposed to be messed up so that we want to seek that deeper multi-dimensional multi area where we know ourselves to be coming from, but we've forgotten it. And that the more we connect with that and trust it, then the more that we can come from that, even if it looks messy, even if there, they think, you know, there aren't a lot of people that are going to, to sort of pick up on that initially. But if we keep coming from that, then, you know, you, you really, you, you can start to incorporate it in your work. I think you're right. That's, a, yeah, fantastic statement. Because I think that the more people who can become and behave authentically with trust of all of the people they meet, the more it spreads. Mm. I don't know if that's yeah. what you're saying, but that's one of my takeaways from what you were saying. But it is also, very interesting because one of the, the foremost, in other words, one of the first books, it's called Trust, uh, that was written basically 
I had even sort of missed this the first time that I went through it. And I had to do a, a sort of a spiritual journey with a Native American Indian group that, that, that brought me back to it. In his analysis, he, he put in that the, the movement toward trust starts internally. Can you trust yourself mm-hmm. not to hurt yourself? Mm-hmm. Because if you can't trust at that level. Then you start building this whole system around you to make up for that. That's a beautiful insight. Oh. Is this Jack Gibbs' book? Yes, exactly. Yep. It's literally a footnote in his outline of the thing that, that fortunately I was sort of guided to, to find that said, oh, by the way, when you're trying to build trust, understand where it's coming from. Mm-hmm. There's another um, book that's tangential, but I'll throw it out, Jerry, so you can capture it in notes. I'm not quite up to speed on the note board. Um, I read it probably 35 years ago, If You Meet the Buddha on the Road, Kill Him, that mm-hmm. shows pop, which is all around inner wisdom. And that anybody who tries to tell you what to do to be wise is automatically a false Buddha. Mm-hmm. Cool. A book I've not read, by the way. Anyone else? Other closing thoughts? Um, the the piece uh, a, a piece of what you were just saying, Bill, resonates really strongly with me around what I was saying earlier around one of my outsider theories is that is that people who suffered a lot of abuse will create great things, create great art, is a little bit and, and this is percolating a lot more now through this conversation is the idea that pressure leads to great out, outputs, great outcomes, great things. That my favorite music in the world is 1970s Argentine Brazilian music, basically Nueva Trova, uh, Tropicalismo music. And those people were all exiles because their governments were busy kidnapping people and killing them. They were under extreme sort of social pressure. There's been lots of you know social pressure, and there's more of it coming right now apparently in the world. But uh, and Brazil just elected a guy who's promised to make life so miserable for leftists, they will either want to leave the country or be killed. He said so explicitly in his last speech before being elected. It's quite frightening. But the idea that these kinds of pressures force us to introspect, force us to connect, force us to build, you know, uh, build ideas differently. Um, uh, parallel and behind this notion is that Prosperity and comfort breed laziness and the lack of need to discover these things and rediscover them and then we forget them Mm -hmm. and then we allow the wave to sort of happen again. So there might be a, there's probably, there's, God knows there's a whole bunch of wave and cycle theories. I I, I keep a bunch of them in my brain, but, but um, I think that, 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 that's kind of interesting here, but trying to figure out what is the path so that we can form these connections to me is, is really interesting. Uh, a, A final note on that. Uh, if you go to the former East Germany, you know, to the DDR or the Soviet Union, where everybody knows that the government is not trustworthy, and in the DDR, one in 10 citizens are actually spies for the Stasi, the gray market, the black market, is an extreme high trust market. Mm-hmm. The way you actually stay alive by trading favors and you know, giving somebody a chicken or some potatoes or whatever outside of the official economy is a life or death matter. And when you can go to the supermarket and buy potatoes and a roasted, a roasted chicken for almost nothing, you don't see any of that. That is not palpable to you, not necessary. You don't need to go to those depths of soul and risk to enter that kind of trust. So one of my questions is, to me, how do we get into a society that's comfortable enough that we're all living well, yet not so cozy that we forget why we're doing the difficult things that we're doing? Right, because consumerism just wants us to be lazy consumers in the barca lounger, drinking buds mm-hmm. and watching the football game, right. which is what this weekend is all about. This is Thanksgiving weekend, right? Lots mm-hmm. of football games. Um, so, how do we get away from being mere consumers, get back to being citizens? Is vulnerability and trust the path to that? And I think yes. That's I why I made this. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. why I think I made, I made this the topic for this call. It's like, but but but. It's really hard to change people's behaviors, and it's very hard to take comfy, comfy people and disrupt their lives. They don't want that. That said, I think our lives are uncomfortable enough right now that 40% of the U.S. population just voted for Donald Trump for president. Mm-hmm. They, they, they want the system shattered. They want the system broken, I think, partly because their lives are that uncomfortable and their future looks that bleak. 
Now, part of that is jingoism and, oh my God, there's immigrants coming and my country won't be my country anymore. That's clearly a note there. Another part of it is, hey, in the big rush to globalization that Bill Clinton was so hot on, my town lost all employers and nobody's come back and helped us do anything. And we're screwed and my kids are screwed. And at best, they've traveled off to the big cities, but, but, but here is dying and, and dead. So, so I think these things are all, of course, deeply intertwingled. It, it would be uh, interesting in one of the talks to maybe frame a topic around <coughs> catalysts for change uh, in the sense of what causes individuals or organizations to seek better wisdom or to find their new wisdom. Um, and it can be internally or externally driven. Um, and unfortunately, we seem to allow the external to be the driver. It has to get really, really bad before we respond with the situation. But I think maybe catalysts or um, aha moments or something would be useful because what I find in the dialogues I'm having with people as I attempt to pursue this strange journey I'm on is understanding where they are and kind of reinforcing their issue points to understand them more fully and then they're willing to tell me more. Mm -hmm. It's a very simple technique, but I mean, it's, I guess, I think there's wisdom in this chat room of, of other people who have found things that are catalytic <laughs> things that we might institutionally build on or non-institutionally build on as was pointed out as well in the conversation, which I really like a lot. That was probably my hopeful shot for the day is that the chaos is really constructive. <laughs> that was actually a good bright spot for me. It's like, hey, life is meant to be chaotic and we, that forces us to find our way through it was, was brightening for me as well, Bill. Thank you. That, that was a, a nice Thank contribution. A any other last minute thoughts before we uh, we'll wind up this one? Michael, Ken, anybody? If not, um, thank you for joining this ride. I really appreciate it. I think I, I love this call. This is this is terrific. I'll put it on YouTube again. I'll uh, make notes onto the Inside Jerry's Brain list. Please put any afterthoughts on that list or critiques or improvements. Or uh, if you want to frame a topic for a future call, Judy, if you want to talk about what causes individuals to seek better wisdom or what, what are the catalysts, say it out loud on the list and I will package that up and pick a time that works for us. Uh, I'm not very good at doodle polling and doing the whole, you know, I just kind of pick times and hope that people can show up. Uh, but I think if we move forward on this, we, we can kind of get somewhere and share some interesting things out. Mm -hmm. um, anybody who wants to help author any of the websites I'm building, just say so, and I'll give you uh, edit access. I'm using Google Sites, which is super duper easy. Google so what? If you're, uh, Google Sites, oh. which, used to, which used to be Jotspot. They bought, do, you they a, bought, do you have a map available, Jerry, of the sites you're working on or something that, that would allow one of us who doesn't know what you're doing to say, oh, well, that one is actually interesting to me. Mm -hmm. That would be great. Good point. Uh, so right this minute, I'm, I'm creating a now page on jerrymikulski.com. So actually, let me publish it, and you can take a look at it right now. Uh, so let me, uh, if you go, bah, 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 bah. if you go to jerrymikulski.com in the up, top nav menu, you should see slash now. Uh, and I was just working on this yesterday because I realized that I'm, I'm, I'm doing too many things and I'm not sure this is a good map of what I'm up to, but I want to, I want to add to it with the- <coughs> Are you gonna put the map up, Jerry, or? Uh, actually, let me just share the screen, good point. Let me share the screen here at the end of the call so you can see what that page says. It's not a visual map at this point. So it's basically, um, uh, if you click on this link, you'll see uh, Derek Sivers basically said, hey, here's my now page. Why don't, why don't we all put a now page out, which is like, what am I working on now? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, and right now I'm in Google Sites, the editor, so this is not the actual live website. Mm -hmm. But then I say, look, my focus is on trust. I'm going to make this a clickable link into my favorite talk about trust. But then uh, here's a link to consumer. And then these are some of the things I'm building right now. So inside Jerry's brain, what we're doing right now is here. Uh, design from trust is uh, a, a serious effort to try to create a practice or series of layers of practice around designing from trust. Mm -hmm. uh, the joy line is something that came out 
uh, in particular reframing of the insurance industry, but it works for others. If you go there, you'll see a, a talk and a video and a, a bunch of other stuff I did. And then the book I need to finish writing is called What If We Trusted You? And uh, I want to publish it along with uh, a website I have. I have both um, wiwty.com, what if we trusted you.com. And I also have what if we trusted you.com all spelled out. But I also own wwdty.com, why we don't trust you.com. And I think it's important to show that I've looked around and I said, look, there are a hundred different reasons why we're actually idiots all the time. Uh, and in fact, I'll show you, we don't trust you. So I've got, I've got all these, of course, in my brain and collected up under, um, come on brain. So here's, uh, we don't trust you to uh, drive carefully. We don't trust you to get your work done well. We don't trust you to minister to one another. We don't trust you to negotiate gender and sex. We don't trust you to raise your own family alone. We don't trust you to self-educate. We don't trust you to design the spaces you will occupy, each of which links back up to uh, Christopher Alexander, for example, hmm. and the idea of, uh, of uh, open space and uh, pattern languages and all of that. So uh, in fact, what I'm gonna do right now is connect this to pattern languages because pattern languages are a way of educating your average person so that they can take place in the higher level design discussion about whatever the space is, right? So mm -hmm. that's, that's why that's there. So anyway, so I'm collecting all those up. My question is how much of these maps do I share at what level on what website so I'm, uh, any guidance from you about, hey, this was crisp enough that I got something or this made no sense at all will help me steer. Okay, great, thank you. <coughs> any other thoughts before we uh, take this one out? Cool, thank you. Thank you everyone. Very, thank very, you. very much. This is totally fun, I appreciate it. There'll be another couple sure. calls next week. I'll send out a, a schedule shortly. Looking forward, thank you, thank you so much. Thanks, Pleasure. Guys. Bye, everybody.